Oh, it's running too. Okay. Good evening. My name is Carl Ehrlich, and it is my great pleasure to, on behalf of the Israel and Golda Koshitsky Center for Jewish Studies, to welcome you to tonight's special discussion with Michael Posner about his recent book about Montreal's own Leonard Cohen, a discussion which will be moderated by the Koshitsky Center's own David Kaufman. We realize that there are other entertainment options available to you tonight. Hence, we are very grateful that you have chosen to spend your evening with us on this day that is considered by some the most sacred day of the year. Rest assured, however, that our program will be over in time to allow you to watch most, if not all, of the second half. But I can't make any promises about the halftime show, if that's what wets your whistle. Before I introduce the dramatis personae in more detail, allow me to offer a few words of thanks. First and foremost, of course, is uh, to our featured author, Michael Posner, and to his most capable interviewer, David Kaufman. We acknowledge with gratitude the co-sponsorship and support of York University's Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, York's Departments of English, History, and Humanities, the Robart Center for Canadian Jewish Studies at York, and the Association for Canadian Jewish Studies. This evening's program would never have taken place without the extraordinary organizational skills of the Koshitsky Center's coordinator, Julie feinberg Telesnik. And last but not least, we are most appreciative of the technical know-how and skills of Bert Ime and Grant McNair of York's IT department. Michael Posner is a longtime friend of the Kashitsky Center, owing to his participation on the jury of the Canadian Jewish Literary Awards, which we have been honored to host here at York University over the last few years, and to his presence at many of our events, back when we were able to host real live and not only virtual events. He is an award-winning writer, playwright, and journalist, and the author of eight books. These include the Mordechai Richler biography, The Last Honest Man, and the co-written Anne Murray autobiography, All of Me, both of which were national bestsellers. He was Washington bureau chief for McLean's magazine and managing editor of the Financial Times of Canada. Subsequently, he spent 16 years as a senior writer with the Globe and Mail. 
The subject of this evening's discussion is his latest book, The Monumental Leonard Cohen Untold Stories, The Early Years, the first volume of a planned trilogy of biographies of Cohen, which will without doubt be the definitive biographical study of this pivotal figure in Canada's cultural life. David S. Kaufman is an associate professor of history here at York University, where he holds the J. Richard Schiff Chair for the Study of Canadian Jewry. He is the author of The Jews Indian, Colonialism, Pluralism, and Belonging in America, which won a 2020 Association for Jewish Studies Jordan Schnitzer Book Award, one of the most prestigious scholarly awards internationally in the field of Jewish studies. His newest book, an edited volume entitled No Better Home, Jews, Canada, and the Sense of Belonging, was published by the University of Toronto Press just a few weeks ago. He also serves as editor-in-chief of the journal Canadian Jewish Studies, Etudes Juives Canadiennes. During the first part of this evening, David Kaufman will be interviewing Michael Posner about the latter's biography of Leonard Cohen. Following their introductory discussion, we will be opening the floor to your questions. Please submit your questions at any time during the course of the evening by using the Q&A function that you should find at the bottom of your screens, if I remember correctly. We cannot promise that we will be able to get to all of your questions tonight, but we will do our best to address as many as possible. And now it gives me great pleasure to turn the metaphorical microphone over to my colleague, David Kaufman. Well, thank you so much, Carl. Um, thank you, Julie, for organizing this, helping it out. Uh, thank you all for coming, of course. And thank you, Michael, for agreeing to chat with me tonight uh, in public. Uh, and of course, congratulations on writing this book. Uh, I'm very pleased to have the chance to speak with you about Leonard Cohen, Untold Stories, The Early Years, published uh, just a few months ago by Simon & Schuster and uh, available, of course, anywhere uh, you buy your books. Um, thank you, for Carl, for explaining how the evening will work. I'm going to speak with Michael for about 45 minutes or maybe an hour, and then we'll take questions from everybody out there in your own homes. Um, uh, Julie was going to manage the Q&A, and she'll try to find questions on topics that we haven't yet covered and may bundle a couple together or do some rephrasing so that we can pack in as much as possible. Uh, we're also live streaming the event uh, and we're recording it. So it will be available just as soon as we're done. If anyone wants to watch it or send it to someone else to watch later, it's available or will be available on the uh, Israel and Golda Kashitsky Center for Jewish Studies YouTube channel. Okay, Michael, I have, I have so many questions. Um, uh, Hi, David. Well, first of all, let me just thank you and, and the Kashitsky Center for having me. This is really really a delight. I'm really honored to be invited and, and I can't thank you enough. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, let, let's start with something simple. Uh, let, just can you tell us first, when and how did you figure out that you wanted to write on Leonard Cohen? Well, uh, it goes back a ways because um, as Carl suggested, I had done this earlier book on, on Mordecai Richler and then I was scouting around for other candidates. And when I did Mordecai, he had just recently passed. That was just after 2001, 2002. Uh, and Leonard was very much alive. And so I thought, gee, it would be really great to have a, an oral biography of a living figure who could participate. And not, not only participate, but also open doors for me, of course, um, to people who might not otherwise be available. So I wrote him. I, I, I sold a kidney and got his email address. and. Um, and wrote him and pitched him the idea. And he wrote back in a very uh, gentle, dis gently dismissive manner. Um, he said he kind of liked the idea or, or thought it was intriguing or words to that effect, but he was then embroiled in litigation with his former manager and uh, it wasn't a propitious time. And so I dropped the idea that was about 2007. So this is a long time ago. And then after he passed in November, 2016, it occurred to me that I could resurrect that idea. I, at that time, I was, I was um, unemployed, unemployed. 
um, working as a freelance writer and uh, looking for ideas. And I thought this is still viable, uh, even though he wasn't with us. So, uh, so I began. So that's how it began. Um, it's um, Untold Stories is an unusual biography in that it's a curated oral history. So it assembles many shards of stories and commentary into chronological order uh, with all the tensions and disagreements and missing parts all lined up, but in a way not so neatly. The volume includes, by my count, 318 different voices. These are people who knew him, uh, family members, friends, acquaintances, lovers, collaborators, uh, in a kind of linear kaleidoscope. Um, I love Sohil Dali's uh, blurb on the back, which praises you for pushing the horizons of biographical possibility, which is a great phrase. Uh, and I think it's actually an amazing feat of writing. Uh, it brought to mind Walter Benjamin's famous arcades project or the American experimental writer David Markson's books. Do you know him, Reader's Block or Wittgenstein? Marks, Markson, I know, not the former, but I did know, know of Markson, yes. So listen, I, I'm no scholar of bibliographic or biographic form, but I can recognize that this is an unusual form of biography. You know, most oral history projects that are not biographies are more like databases, you know, than single narratives. So that researchers, researchers can access certain parts that they may be looking for and they can kind of cut the data by keyword or age or gender or whatever, but there's not necessarily one narrative. Um, I know of only a couple of oral history biographies, but they're not about people. Like one, one I know of was about punk and another about jazz. And there's a famous one by Studs Terkel, which is an oral history biography of work. So I'm wondering if you could tell us about why you chose to organize the book this way. And did you have other models that you used yeah, I, I, there were other there, there were a couple of other models. Studs Terkel to me invented the form. I don't know if in other languages, perhaps other people worked in the same format. But I read Studs Terkel's book uh, Division Street America when I was about twenty, I think, and um, and it blew me away um, because not only was he capturing all these voices. Um, Division Street is is literally a street in Chicago that essentially divided the city between white and black. And, and he interviewed scores, if not hundreds of people on both sides of that divide and, and came up with these amazing stories of, of the separateness and the interactivity. And, and beyond that, he was able to, in a way that I think this book, my own book, doesn't quite, isn't able to achieve because there's so many voices, but he was able to capture the individual essence of every speaker, you know, their, their speech patterns and their idio, idioms that they used. And, and you almost felt when you came away from reading any particular segment that you were in touch with that individual who was a unique individual. Uh, it was an astonishing feat. So he was definitely an influ influence. Um, uh, later, um, Merle Miller wrote a wonderful um, oral biography of Harry S. Truman, um, which I also read, and 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 you know, and it struck me that you could do interesting things with oral history, with oral biography, um, and so um, so I adopted that for the for the Mordecai Richler project as well. It was a more modest enterprise. I think maybe I interviewed 130 people for that. Um, and and it you know it it looks like amateur hour compared to the to the cone because although you're right I, I don't know what the number of voices in this particular book is but but I'm north of 530 at this point for the three books so it's it's um, it's it's a large canvas um, and 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 so it isn't everybody's cup of tea um, what it does I think is give you different aspects of, of an individual's character, but it also forces the reader to make some decisions as, as he or she is reading, such as where does the balance of truth lie here? Who, 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 has, who has the greater monopoly on truth? Uh, which version of events is accurate? Um, so it isn't, it isn't a perfect form, but, it, but it's an intriguing form and, and it appeals to me. Yeah. Will the uh, will the raw interview materials be 
donated to like an archive or something so that they can work like other oral history collections. I know yes. that the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library at U of T has something like 25 boxes of Leonard Cohen papers. Uh, or more. I, I, I fully intend to, to, I have every interview I've done on tape and I fully intend to to make that donation to the to the archive at some point, if and I assume they'd be interested. Yes. So um, you've written other biographies before, as we've we've now heard. Of course, the co-written one with Anne Murray and this one on Mordecai Richler. Richler, um, can you just tell us a little more about the similarities and differences? Well, um, Mordecai was the same, except smaller in scale, uh, partly because his life was smaller in scale. Frankly, he 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 was he was a, a full time novelist and writer. Um, his life was pretty much lived behind a desk. Um, and, and at the end of the day, he went drinking with his pals. And, and, and then he, you know, he would get into occasional dust ups. He was a kind of curmudgeonly character and he, he liked to uh, ruff, ruffle people's feathers in writing. And so there were some interesting feuds that he got into. So um, it, it was pretty straightforward. I, I did have the cooperation of his of his uh, of his widow Florence at the time, and she she was instrumental. She was essential, in fact, to the successful successful completion of that book. And Murray is a different um, kettle of fish entirely because I essentially was the ghostwriter on the project. I wrote it, but it's based on many many interviews with her and and her approval approval of, of the of the text, of course. So two two different books. Um, and Leonard was just became more ambitious because he lived such a larger life. He lived a Jewish life. He lived a Zen Buddhist life. He lived a huge literary life that continued even after his career in music uh, took off. And of course, he lived a huge uh, musical life, um, you know, 10 or 11 or 12 albums. I can't remember exactly. Um, and, and then, of course, that's even before you begin to explore his romantic life, which was, which was multifaceted as well. Uh, what were the most surprising things that you uh, newly learned about the man in the course of researching this book? Maybe, maybe you'll tell me like one delightful thing that you learned and one unsettling thing you learned. Well, um, there's some unsettling things that are all appear in, in the second volume. And so I, I might not want to tip my hand just now, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, on, on that score, but, but there are some, some revelations to come. Um, not, nothing, um, uh, I don't think anything untoward, but, but just in terms of the known biography of Leonard, there will be some revelations. Um, in terms of the surprises, uh, I'm not sure that I was surprised by so much. Um, I, I think that his work is gonna last for a very long time. Uh, and I think it's going to last because he was a true artist and, and that his work invites um, intense investigation and, and academic analysis, as well as, as just ordinary reader analysis. Um, I, I think he's going to be there for the duration. I, I'm, I, was, I don't know if I was surprised by it, but I was certainly struck by the man's work ethic. Um, you know, you sometimes look at somebody's life and he had kids and he traveled a lot and he was romancing this woman and that woman and you, you wonder how this, this work got done. And, but, but he was a craftsman um, and, and he had, an, he had a, a, an industrious work ethic. Um, so, you know, there are legends about how many verses of Hallelujah were written and how long it took him to translate the Lorca poem that became the song Take This Waltz, which I think was 150 hours. Um, but, but this was true for many of his songs. They would take years and he would write and rewrite and drop a word here and add a word there and take it out this comma. So, so that work ethic um, was extraordinary. So that, that really struck me. The biggest surprise for me from, from this of your first, the three books concerned how much acid Leonard Cohen dropped. So <laughs> if, I, if I read it right, it seems he took something like 300 LSD trips. Well, he confessed to that, I think. Like yeah. 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 So, I mean, like the, these, they probably weren't spread out evenly, but it could mean that he had the experience of 
you know, synesthesia and hallucination and other burst open perception doors, you know, feelings of union with others and nature and God, something like every other week. So that, that is a lot of psychotropic experience. And to my mind, this has some explanatory heft in the story of a poet who was interested in reality expansion and in rewriting the mundane human experience of life and of the self. Um, am, I, am I right about that? Oh, I think you're totally right. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, he later in life would, would have added a cautionary note about the dangers of, 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 of drugs in general uh, and specifically LSD, especially for schizophrenics. Um, and he saw many, many friends and members of his own generation laid waste by their uh, inability to control their appetite for drugs. But, but yes, from, from the early 60s on, um, uh, for a good 20 years, he, he, was, he was indulging and he, 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 he was open to any possible avenue. So yes, LSD and, and speed and, and of course, uh, marijuana and, and hashish and, and, and anything basically. He was, he, was, he was taught by the great um, Irving Layton that he should open his mind and his body to every possible experience if he wanted to be a great writer. And he took that lesson to heart. May I ask, have, have you experienced these compounds? And if so, I mean, you don't have to answer, of course, but if, 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 do you feel like knowing what you know, is it an important element of you know, what he was really trying to get at in his work? I think it was, I think it was a tool for him. Um, you know, it was a tool to, to open his mind to, to what were then very novel ideas. You know, the, the society was changing the drug revolution was underway, um, and he was very much through the mid '60s, even into the late '60s, very much at that time an advocate for LSD and for mind-bending experiences. Um, I, I've never really, I never used LSD. I, the only psychotropic drug that I've used is ayahuasca, and, and only on one occasion. Um, but that occasion was so profound and transformative for me that I would say, I don't know that I could say that it's given me, it would, be, it would be wrong to suggest that it's given me an appreciation for what Leonard Cohen was, was undertaking or going through. But, but it certainly was profound for me and, and suggestive of the kind of world that I think the worlds that are out there that we really, in our day-to-day -day lives, rarely even glimpse. Um, it, it, it does bend your consciousness and, 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 and that it can bend it for positive or negative effects, as you know. Yeah. Um, okay, shifting gears a little. So not much uh, of this book was is really taken up with interpreting uh, his published words, you know, his novels, songs, poems, Correct. not as much as I expected, frankly. You, you do talk about some songs in this one's famous Blue Raincoat, so Long Marion, The Stranger Song, a couple others. Uh, my favorite was the little, was the discussion about Bird on a Wire. Um, actually, I think maybe I'll just read this little passage if, if you don't mind. Go for it. Leonard Cohen himself said, so, so he's in Hydra, um, he's on Hydra in Greece and they install telephone wires. Uh, and he says, I had come there with some myth of having lost, abandoned the modern world. Suddenly, there was this symbol of modernity straight across my window. The window looked at a beautiful lane where there was an almond tree in full bloom. And suddenly, there were these horizontal violations of my perfect window. And of course, I was angry and disappointed. But I knew there was no point, no point in entertaining these kinds of emotions because it was useful and we could have light and telephones. And while I was having these conflicted feelings, a bird came, probably the wire's first bird, because I think it had just gone up overnight. And the bird just perched on the wire as if it had been strung there for that specific purpose. So it's a, it's a lovely little meditation about loss and disappointment and the modern condition. Um, but more broadly, I, I, it made me think like, so we got much more about the man than his works. And I'm, I'm curious how deliberate this was 
Uh, was this a product of the kinds of questions that you asked your interview subjects or you know, editorial decisions after the fact? Both, I think. Um, certainly the former, because the reality is that for somebody to be able to provide learned commentary on, on his work, on his poems or on his lyrics, uh, you'd almost have to be inside his head. Um, I could interview any number of, of academics or, or average people who might want to suggest what a certain poem or song meant, but that's going to be entirely speculative. Um, or what I was trying to do where possible in dealing with an, an individual poem or an individual song was to add some value to, to, to add something new about the creation of the song. So in the case of famous Blue Raincoat, um, I was fortunate enough to find a woman who was literary in, in the New York apartment on Stanton Street uh, when he was writing the song and, and using cocaine uh, and who in her judgment at least uh, makes a brief appearance in the song. Um, I was looking for new material. Um, there will be scores of academics who already have and will in the future continue to pour over these poems and lyrics uh, and try to interpret them. But most of the people that I interviewed would not have been capable of that. They just, they just didn't have, I mean, Leonard himself would have said to, to virtually any interviewer that he wasn't quite sure what the meaning was, but it would be up to you to decide what you thought the meaning was for you. So, um, so that was, that was the main thing. And then yes, inevitably it becomes an editorial decision as well, because I don't know that, you know, I'm trying to write a biography here and I'm trying to give you different aspects of the human being. Um, it's, not, it's not an in literary investigation. And, and that is a short, shortcoming of oral biography, no question about it. You put your, your finger quite accurately on that. Um, but I'm happy to live with that limitation. Well, I agree that, I mean, the value added is all this perspective about the man. So, I mean, I think it was a, a fair trade-off and, you know, uh, it seems like a Thank smart. Um, so about the man, you know, the, the, the book offers an avalanche of adjectives that modify Leonard's person or his persona. Uh, some of my favorites were moody, enchanting, mesmerizing, arrogant, caustic, funny, narcissistic, marvelous, untrustworthy, witty, and breathtaking. And the book also includes a fair number of roles or kind of identity claims for the man. Uh, shaman, he was a priest, uh, a refugee, a troubadour, you hear that one a few times, a, a trickster, a, a messiah, a spider, a womanizer, and a genius. Um, I loved uh, Leon Wieseltier's description of him in the book. Uh, he, he, you quote him as saying that Leonard, Leonard's poise was his triumph, his method of self-mastery, the profoundly moving evidence of his sovereignty over his rioting appetites. Um, and you yourself call him a seer uh, in your introduction and a cartographer of the human heart. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what my question is, but perhaps you can speak a little bit about what you, know, what you learned about or reflections on the idea of charisma um, in working on this project. Well, he had charisma in spades. Um, and, and, and you see this almost from his childhood on up, you know, certainly from the time that he's, he's a camp counselor at the age of 15 or 16. Even at that time, he has the ability to hold people in thrall to him. Um, I can't imagine he, he had many, much of a skill set uh, in terms of music uh, or, or even his use of language at the time, but there was something completely magnetic about his personality. And so you see it then, you see it even earlier actually in the anecdote, of, a famous anecdote about his hypnotizing the family maid and persuading her to remove her blouse um, for, his, for his private benefit. Um, and, and, and you see it later as when he begins to, at poetry readings in, in the early 60s, when he's 
going around the country reading his poetry. He's, he's the star. Um, even if he's among a group of poets, he's, he's the undoubted star. And then later when he starts his music career in 1970, when, which is when the book ends, this particular volume ends, when he's at the Isle of, of Wight in August 1970 and, and a near riot has broken out. There's four or five or 600,000 people who are, are in a riotous mood, um, drug addicted or drug fueled by alcohol or, or other, other narcotics and, and are lighting fires and, and booing and hissing and throwing chairs. And, you know, they boo at Jimi Hendrix and they boo at Chris Christopherson and they boo at Joni Mitchell. And Leonard comes on out of his mind on, on Man, Mandrax speed uh, at three or four in the morning. And, and within three minutes, the entire crowd has quietened down. So this, this charisma that you, you alluded to is, is an essential part of him. The, the, the other extraordinary aspect of it is that a number of people testify to his ability to be a magnet of a, of a social situation, a room of people, even when he wasn't talking, even perfectly still. And, and I, think, I, I think it's something he actually worked at mm. in the sense of, of figuring out how he should, what his body language ought to be and what his, what his facial expression might be mm. in order to encourage that that kind of attention. Um, it, it, it was part act and part natural, I think, you know, I, I, but, but he, he, was, he was an incredible magus. I think somebody, think of Eva Layton uses that word about him, magus. And, and, and he is, he was, he's, he's multidimensional. He contained multitudes. And so all of these adjectives that you recited at the beginning are, they're all true. I, you don't, He's not somebody you want to reduce to, to priest or lecher or saint or or angel. He's 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 everything. Uh, one of my favorite passages in the book is the uh, juxtaposition of commentary that you provide um, um, by Leonard Cohen and by Seymour Main and by Ruth Roskies about that generation of Montreal Jewish intellectuals' assessments of Judaism. They're all you know in their twenties at the time. And I, I'm going to read you these three passages. So Leonard Cohen says, um, oh, where is it? So Leonard Cohen says, there is an awful truth. We no longer believe we are holy. This is the confession without which we cannot begin to raise our eyes, the absence of God in our midst. Let us encourage young men to go into the deserts of their hearts and burn the praise of perfection. Let us do it with drugs or whips or sex or blasphemy or fasting, but let men begin to feel the perfection of the universe. We need our dirty saints and our monstrous hermits. Let us create a tradition for them for they light the world. So Leonard's inviting a quest for God or for holiness in distinctly non-traditional ways. And then, and, then you, and then you put Seymour Maine in who says, well, Cohen is generalizing. Study remained. Jews wanted to be successful, establish themselves and build their big cathedral synagogues as if to say to their Christian neighbors, we have arrived and we're proud of it. The large synagogues, the new plutocrats, he was right to criticize it, but there were other streams in Jewish society. So he ha kind of has some ambivalent praise of the Jewish community. And then Ruth Weiss says, I, discover, I discovered that the affiliated Jew is the iconoclast of, the affiliated Jew is the iconoclast of every, gen, of every age. And when I realized that neither Leonard nor anyone else would be the significant truth teller of my generation, I began to have regrets about him. He who cast himself as love's solitary survivor so that he would not have to bear the weight of his and my lonely community or of the tattered culture that belongs to us all. So, I mean, first of all, it's all beautiful writing, of course, these people speak so eloquently, no, but here, you know, Ruth is clearly disappointed with her fellow young Jewish artists and intellectuals abandonment of Jewish culture uh, and, and soul. So I'm a historian of Canadian Jewish life. And as far as I know, nobody has done any sort of systematic study of this particularly important generation 
you know, their, their coming of age, their reckoning with the Jewish tradition or the burden. So I'm hoping you could shed some light on what was actually going on as this younger generation of Montreal Jews found its voice in the turbulent 60s. You know, do any of these three voices better capture that generation's relationship with God or the Jewish religion, you know, better than others? Well, there's a few things to be said perhaps here. Um, uh, I think if anybody captures it best, it's probably, I mean, they're all accurate in their own way. Uh, they're, they're, they're all faithful to their own perspective. Um, Leonard, as a young man, was, there's, this, this excerpt is taken from one of two addresses he gave at the Jewish Public Library in late 1963 and mid-1964. Uh, and, and this is just a small, and you, you can find these online, and I encourage people who are interested to do so because they're, apart from anything else, you, you, get, you come away with just in awe of his ability to write, um, never mind the message. Um, but they do reflect his position at the time, which is that there was complete sterility in the organized Jewish community. And yes, there was synagogue attendance uh, at, at high holidays and, 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 uh, and Shabbos, but, but there, was no, there was no holiness. God had been stripped out of the equation. And without God, what did it all mean? It meant nothing. So that was the that was the, the light that he was trying to shine on, on the Jewish community in Montreal. Um, and, and I think Seymour is just more forgiving of, of the existence of the community at that time, which, in, which was made up in often of Holocaust survivors who were just struggling to find their way in, in, in the post-war post -war world. And, and, and if they were, going about their Jewish observance and tradition in a kind of rote-like way, then they should be forgiven for it because they had endured great suffering and they were just struggling to make a living and, and many of them made very good livings. And, and, and this was in some respect a compensation for the suffering they had endured. Um, Ruth's comment I think is a more personal one, which is that she had put Leonard on a pedestal as this great leader of the Jewish world. And he was at that time renouncing um, such a position. He wanted no, no part of it. Although there is something messianic in his, in his words. And, and he did, and I, and I think some portion of him, I don't know what portion of him, I think it's an interesting speculation, but the some portion of him did see himself as something of a prophet. Um, I, I think I think his his future career in music, many of his songs, not that they are expressly prophetic, but they are songs that address the human condition in a very broad way, and they are infused not just with the Jewish tradition at that point, but with the Zen tradition and and the Christian tradition as well. Um, uh, he was a guy who read widely and deeply in different religions. Uh, later in life, he's um, he becomes conversant with Advaita, with uh, with Hinduism, and and uh, or, or one dimension of Hinduism, and he and he brings that to bear on his work. Um, so, the other final point I'll make on this is simply that Leonard, if when he looked back on that speech or those speeches in later life, would have said of himself, "I was too harsh." Hmm. Um, he said that, in fact, of of A. M. Klein. Uh, who, in, who he is very harsh on in one of these speeches and, and is asked about it some years later and says, I, I, was, I was too harsh. I, I, he was a stand-up guy. Um, he was doing what he thought was right for the community. Uh, and Ruth Roskies herself in, in the 90s um, has a kind of coming to terms with Leonard Cohen and sees that in, his, in, the, in the character, in the persona that he has created the persona that he has created as a as a rock star as a singer songwriter has indeed become a kind of beacon for the Jewish people, mm -hmm. um, and of course there is most famously um, some of I'm sure many of the members of the audience will be aware of this that in 20, 2009 when he goes to Israel um, and he closes the concert in Tel Aviv by duchening by holding it doing the priestly Kohanic blessing. Um, for the audience. 
um, he took that role quite seriously. Um, and and I think he, I think he would have modified his the criticisms that he he voices in in the, that excerpt that you read. Well, I'm looking forward to reading the evolution his evolution in uh, in your future future volumes on this on this count. Um, so the book is pretty new; it hasn't been reviewed a lot just yet. But one reviewer that I read was sharply critical of the way they interpreted what they what they interpreted as your over focus on Cohen's sexual life and critical either of Cohen's sexual predation or womanizing, and I think even perhaps critical of you for failing to call out your subject as a super seducer, is her words in the, in the, or his, I'm not sure if it was. So I certainly noted in my own reading that you as an interviewer must have certainly prompted at least some debate among your interview subjects. Uh, you include a section, for example, about the extent to which his writings about Kateri Takakwith and indigeneity in Beautiful Losers should be judged as cultural appropriation or not. So, well, you know, well, some of your interview subjects were clearly highly critical of Cohen's sexual exploits. It seemed to me that you didn't provoke this kind of debate intentionally. Uh, but my question is that in the wake of Me Too, um, do you think our image of Leonard Cohen ought to be tarnished? Uh, and can you reflect on your own decisions and thought processes in deciding how to write and include a discussion about his sexuality? You know, I'm 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 ambivalent on this point because you know I do I do appreciate the the critique, which is you know that if you're going to judge him through the prism of the Me Too movement, his behavior doesn't look uh, altogether uh, shining. Um, that said. Um, he, he wasn't predatory. He wasn't Harvey Weinstein. He wasn't uh, Roman Polanski. Um, um, he, he was charming. He was seductive. He was, and more than that, it, it wasn't just that he seduced these women. These women became often his muses. They became the essence of his material for for his work. They, uh, I, I'm, I, in some respects, I think I'm what what I was trying to do was to help people identify people in his life who became inspirations for specific songs and poems, uh, and and I think that work will be done eventually. I, it, I didn't see it as my role to necessarily do that, but but in drawing out these stories of his relationships. With so many women, I was trying to head it in that direction. Um, at the same time, I'm not sure he should be judged through the modern lens of, of the Me Too movement. Um, uh, we, can, we can certainly say, and people do say, that he could not possibly <laughs> write Beautiful Losers in the current environment. He would, he wouldn't, it would never be published. I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. No matter how brilliant a book it may be, and some people think it is one of the great novels of, of the late 20th century. Um, but what? Oh, go ahead. You froze for me. There. All right. If you can hear me, you just put push pause on this thought, and I'll 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 ask my next question, and hopefully you'll uh, the internet will kick back in, unless of course it's my internet. Seems to be fine. Um, okay, so um, the the sixties and the parts of the seventies that belonged in the sixties are uh, are kind of backup singers for the book. Um, um, uh, we get little scraps about the quiet revolution. We get about Vietnam, uh, some broad references to the turbulent times. Uh, and Leonard Cohen was most certainly countercultural. Uh, but like uh, Bernie Wexler said, Barry Wexler said of him, uh, you're never which sure of the side, which, which, never sure which side of the revolution he was on. Uh, and you yourself add that Leonard was very much of the times, yet suspicious of the left, uh, and that he moved rightward in his later years. 
So as a historian, I'm just fascinated with how our lived lives are both shaped by our historical moment and the big events that happen around us. And yet at the same time, we just live our intimate and work lives almost independent of these things. And of course, now is one of these times. There are these hugely transformative things that are happening around us. You know, shifter, sh history, you know, history shifting right under our nose. And yet, you know, every day, everyday life just kind of continues. Um, Michael, I see because you're muted, but I wondered. So first, unmute yourself. Yep. And did you get the gist of this question, or or? or I don't know what was the question? I'm sorry, I'll have to ask you to repeat it. Yeah, so I, I, I'm curious about, um, you know, about the 60s and the kind of the, the world that is the backdrop, the, you know, the, the world that's the backdrop of, of, his, of his life. So he, he clearly, we, we get a little bit of this world. We get the quiet little scraps about the quiet revolution and about Vietnam and talk of the turbulent times. Um, and as I said, for the audience already, they'll hear this twice. He was certainly countercultural. Um, but like Barry Wexler said of him, you were never quite sure which side of the revolution he was on. And you yourself add that he was you know, of the times, but suspicious of the left. And he moved a little rightward later in his years. So uh, as a historian, I'm really fascinated by how we can live our ordinary lives, our work lives, our intimate lives, our family and friend lives. And yet, at the, and at the same time, there's you know, hugely transformative world things that are happening around us and that they, they don't necessarily meet up. And we're actually living in a time like that right now where there are massive, you know, global shaping changes happening right under our noses. And yet we live our kind of ordinary lives. So I wondered if you could just reflect a little bit on, you know, Cohen as, you know, as a creature of the, of the 60s, or at least for, from this part of the book, of course, which is what we're focused on. Well, I think you're right. He is certainly countercultural through the through the 1960s, um, but he's also very focused on his own life. You know, he's certainly aware of all these currents and he has ideas about them. But as he becomes a singer songwriter, and his career takes off first in Europe, not in North America, not even in Canada, um, the Europeans embrace him as as a you know, as, as in the French tradition um, of, of singer-songwriters, and, and they embrace his, his lyrics and his poetry. And, but it becomes clear to him that this is a left-wing audience. Uh, these, these people are, are very far left of center, and his own instincts aren't there. He had been to Cuba in 1961, and he had gone to Cuba with, um, you know, wide-eyed and quite excited to witness this revolution in progress. And it took him less than a week uh, with the loudspeakers blaring instructions to the population on the streets to decide that this was as more authoritarian than any culture he'd ever seen. And, and that was a profound experience for him. Um, and his suspicion of the left never, never really deviated. So what happens in his public life is that he becomes very careful about expressing these kinds of opinions because he knows that really he'd be alienating his core audience. Mm. Um, and this is particularly true about, um, it becomes true on, on many levels, but particularly true about his opinions on the state of Israel as, as Israel becomes increasingly a target of left-wing criticism for its behavior on the West Bank and, and the settlements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he's, he's a profound Zionist. Uh, his instincts are to the right, but he's very careful and circumspect about expressing those views. Um, I don't know that he's such a perfect embodiment of that 60s ethos, frankly. I think he's just too much his own man. He's living his own day-to-day -day life. He's, he's writing his songs. He's chasing women to get inspiration or for romantic liaisons or for whatever reason. He has a young family in the early 70s. Um, I don't think he's caught up wrestling with the large questions of communism versus capitalism um, or any of that debate. I think he's certainly aware of it. It doesn't play much of a role in his work. I mean, maybe you could look at a song later like, you know, Democracy uh, is Coming to the USA as, as 
some sort of commentary. But, but really those kinds of songs are few and far between in the Leonard Cohen canon. Um, so I kind of see him as a bit of an outlier. He's not really part of, in the, in the way that Dylan is, you know, or Joan Baez or, or even Joni Mitchell. Leonard's his own man. He's, he's, he's doing his own thing. Um, we've been speaking about your book, um, what you've you know, supplied. Uh, and I wanna shift gears a little now and ask you your thoughts about the demand side of the story, um, you know, to the something of an obsession that we or some part of we seem to share now, you know, obviously, you know, there's a stunning cottage industry of Leonard Cohen cultural products of murals and programs and exhibitions and scholarly works and covers and films and fan sites, you know, there's something like 9,000 academic articles in, you know, half a dozen languages in a half a dozen different scholarly fields. Um, and I mean, I have no problem, of course, with this. I think it's fascinating. And I think, you know, there's something like 1500 biographies of Lincoln and still new ones coming out every year. Um, and that's a good thing. And it's partly because the biography tells us as much about the moment it was written uh, as it does about its subjects. So I'm wondering if you had any reflections on, on you know, what, what our attention to Leonard Cohen says about us, maybe as Canadians and maybe as Jews in particular, I'm interested in your reflections. I don't know about the Jewish part of that. Uh, and I'm not even sure about the Canadian part of it. You know, there is on Facebook, a number of, of Leonard Cohen fan club sites. There's half a dozen of them. And each of them have uh, oh, up, upwards of 1,000 to 10,000 members. More seem to be joining, more people seem to be joining every week. Uh, they are joining every week. And every week, the, the administrators of these fan club sites post the names of those new members. 90% of those names do not live in North America. Mm. And, and I would say 90% of those names are not Jewish names, at least to my somewhat trained eye. Um, and it speaks to his universality is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I do know, of course, that there's a nine story mural uh, painted on a, on a office building in downtown Montreal. And I can't think of another artist. I mean, I'm sure there are statues in various European countries to the great European writers and thinkers. Uh, and poets, but I can't think of, a, of another Canadian who, who, you know, Margaret Atwood, Christopher Plummer, um, <laughs> William, what other Canadian has a nine story mural? What other, what other artist in the world? This even, this is even before we begin to tackle, you know, the meaning of his, of his, of his words, the meaning of his poetry and his, and his lyrics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm convinced that that he will that that he will continue to be a subject of study, notwithstanding the fact that we only have two novels and and um, I don't know if I can't remember exactly how many books of poetry, but there are I think in his archive other novels and other short stories and other works of fiction that will be released in time, and the songs themselves I think lend themselves to. Uh, to study and analysis. Um, he was able to write songs that in his lyrics, not, I'm not talking about the melody, just the lyric. He was able to write songs that somehow captured the vernacular of, of, our, of our language and yet pitch it in a way that, uh, that was highly elevated, that, that, that was symbolic. Um, and so he's able to capture the, both the mundane and the spiritual in, 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 one, in one go, and to do it in almost in monosyllables often. Yeah. Um, it's an extraordinary yeah. thing. Yeah. I'm sorry? Casio keyboard. With, with a Casio keyboard after 1984, yes, exactly. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, that's no, the it's, best it's I great, can do. Great. I mean, I think it's really astonishing and quite heartening actually, I mean, because you know, we clearly value him, you know, like it's like the famous observation about, you know, architecture, you know, the tallest building tells you something about what's, what the culture values, and we clearly value him. And yet, you know, 
we show quite little value for poetry and for esoteric thinking, you know, and for in our culture in general. Uh, and so it's it's kind of heartening to me that he's, you know, he's he's elevated to this stature. And I'm I'm personally kind of noodling with the idea that, you know, there, there's something redemptive that we look to him, you know, we look to we could find something redemptive in 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 taking him in because he, you know, he he performs his failures you know, with God and with man, so spectacularly successful. And maybe there's something like, you know, maybe we can too, or maybe we can just fall through ourselves a little bit more easily, or, or I don't know, something about needing, you know, a kind of existential hero who's just mere, um, you know, a mere mortal of appetites. Um, well, that's very well put. There's a, there's a little anecdote that appears in the, in the second book, which I might just share with you because it it perhaps speaks to this point. And it's 1973, and a young woman who is, is only a, a platonic friend of Leonard's finds herself with her boyfriend in a, in a Greek discotheque in Athens. And, and it's all Greeks ex except for the odd tourist. And, and she and her boyfriend, as she, as she told me the story, had just finished making love in the washroom. And they come back to the the main discotheque hall and the song Suzanne comes on the loudspeaker or the DJ puts on Suzanne, Leonard's first famous song and arguably his most famous song. And the entire audience stands up out of respect. They don't sing, they just listen, they don't dance. They just listen to the song. It's a kind of collective salute uh, to the honor of Leonard Cohen. And, and, you know, they embraced him. She called him a soul shaman. You're going to see a few more adjectives in book two. So a soul shaman, which is a shaman, which is, which is a pretty good, pretty good, pretty good phrase, I think. Um, yeah, he, he, people respond to his, his lyrics. They, they, they do it in, in, in very powerful ways. So this is book one of three, as we know, um, and it takes us from his childhood until his mid thirties. Um, so I assume the work is already done for the next two volumes, or at least most of it. Uh, we're just wondering, you know, will the change and when? When are we gonna? When? When are the next ones gonna be out? And you know, no way. Actually, maybe I'll add a, a follow up question. Knowing what you know now about having written this one, uh, will will the volumes that you know will there be lessons that you'll apply to the future volumes? Well, for sure there will. Um, you know, I'm still I'm still um, collecting. I mean, much of volume two is is done. Um, it, it needs some some trimming and some cutting, which is going to be somewhat painful. But but that's an, a part of the exercise. Um, but people, a number of people have come out of the woodwork, so to speak, after the publication of volume one, with stories about Leonard. Sometimes they're stories from the period of book one, which is unfortunate, but but some are not, and so um, so you know if if there are people who who have a Leonard Cohen story, whether it's five minutes of his time that was profoundly influential or moving in some fashion or or reflective of his character, then that would be of interest. Um, that, that's or, an invitation, to be clear. Is that right? That's kind of an invitation, yeah. To our kind of, audience today. Yeah, to the audience, yeah. That's it's what I heard. I heard if you, if you out there listening have a story about an encounter with Leonard Cohen that you have, you can write to Michael Posner. Maybe I'm not, I'm not hard to find. Um, um, so, so book two is, is well underway. Book three is, is well underway, but not as well underway, I guess. And there's more reporting and more interviewing still to be done. Um, you know, there, there are, I, I want to be clear here. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that my book will, will show him in, 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 in his coat of many colors, his Conian coat of many colors. Um, but these are not definitive biographies. There are many people that I am not getting to who I would dearly love to get to and, and who other biographers have tried and failed to get to as well as well. Um, so there is there's lots of room for future biographers to 
to continue to explore the, the, the magic and meaning and mystery of Leonard Cohen. Um, I'm going to throw open the, the doors to the Q&A. And so for all of you in the audience, I'll remind you that you can type in a question to Michael using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and that uh, Julie is going to help curate them and sort of try to throw in some new ones that we didn't cover ground on. Uh, but I also wanted just to offer an opportunity for anyone um, of, among our audience or participants um, who's quoted in the book. If, if there are any of you out there, and if you want to um, say something or ask something, you know, in your Q, you know, you can use the Q&A button as well and just identify yourself um, so that Julie will try to get to you as well. Um, okay, so uh, can, we, can we turn it over to the, to the open floor? Thank you, David. Um, so Michael, the first question touches a little bit about what you discussed at the beginning, and that's uh, whether you had the cooperation or permission of Leonard Cohen and or his family. Uh, no, the answer, the short answer is no, and the long answer is no. Um, so there, in dealing with the estate, there are his children, Adam and, and his daughter, son Adam and his daughter Lorca, uh, who live in Los Angeles. And they did not want to participate. Um, um, and I totally kind of understand that. This is, this, I, I think it would be difficult for, for children to, to, you know, throw open the cupboard doors and discuss the relationship with their father over many years. Um, uh, there is also the, the estate, which is essentially his, his manager at the end of his life and his lawyer, um, a Los Angeles lawyer. And, and they were kind of um, not interested in participating. They, they weren't, they weren't um, objecting to the book, but they weren't cooperative. So, which is fine. Um, my instinct was that uh, cooperation would have come with a certain price tag editorially, and it was a price tag I would not have been willing to pay. So I'm happy to have my own independence editorially and, and, and put some distance between myself and the estate. Uh, the next question is this, uh, Torah study in its widest meaning is an excellent way to avoid being caught in the zeitgeist. How much did Cohen submit to or resist the zeitgeist, especially in the light of his own Jewish heritage? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I it's the question would be well how are we defining the zeitgeist i mean he he's 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 of his era but he's also as i tried to suggest earlier somewhat apart from it and above it in a way um somebody somebody in the book calls or will call bob dylan the voice of his generation um uh, and therefore entitled to the prize the winning the nobel prize for literature that he did in in 2016 and, so, and then says in the same breath or in the next breath, Leonard is the voice for all generations. And there's a level at which I think that is true. He's not, he's not trying to capture the zeitgeist particularly. He's trying to capture the human condition in, 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 more, in, in broader terms. Um, and Judaism is very much at the heart of this. It's, it's an essential part of it. But he's not exclusively, he, you know, his first book of poetry in 1956 is Let Us Compare Mythologies. And, and, you know, he's coming at it from the point of view that everybody has their own narrative. And there is value in all of these narratives, whether it's Christian or Zen or Hindu or even Scientology, which is, of course, much in disgrace um, in many quarters. And, and which he briefly experimented with in the, in the late 1960s. Uh, and he left that movement, but he, even when he left it, he, he said, you know, there are things of value there. So he was a very open-minded guy. Um, and so I think he tried to, to inculcate the lessons of his, of his study and his learning, whether Judaic or otherwise, into his work. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, our next question is, uh, was Cohen a muse for Irving Layton or the reverse? What was the relationship between the two about? So um, they're very close friends beginning from the mid 1950s on for the next, to the, to the end of their life. And they spend many 
dozens and hundreds of hours together talking about life, talking about women, talking about poetry for sure, and analyzing poetry, especially in the early years, in the, in the, in the late 1950s. Uh, they would sit down and open a book of W.B. Yeats and, and crack open a poem, as, as, as Irving would say, and dissect it line by line. So I don't know about, if, is, did you use the word muse? That would be wrong. He was, he was, he was not his muse, and Leonard was certainly not Irving's muse. Irving had no, certainly had no male muses. Um, he was a major influence, but the influence isn't in terms of Leonard's own poetry or writing style. I would say Irving's influence is predominantly in how to tackle life itself, how to embrace life, how to how to seize it with both hands and squeeze every drop of life you could out of it and and grasp every experience you possibly could and open yourself to those experiences all in the name of art you know not for the sake of the experience as much as for the sake of the art that would come from it that i think is the major lesson um, for irving Leighton. remember irving is 20 or 20 years older than leonard at least perhaps 25 so um and I don't think, I don't think Leonard is a major influence on Irving at all. He's entirely his own man from from the get go. I will just add quickly that I, that you know, for the reader, for the the person who asked this question, you know, the book has a good deal of content on their relationship and commentary, not obviously by Irving Leighton himself, but about them and you know from people around them. So it's it's a, it's an interesting theme that's well woven into this first volume. Thank you, David. Our next question comes from Professor Sarah Horowitz, uh, who asks, do you think there's something distinctly Canadian about his work or a way that Canada leaves a trace in him? In looking at the work, I'm not sure there's much of a Canadian trace. I mean, I, I, I think this is open for discussion and, and people might disagree and, 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 and I might well be wrong. Um, so I don't, I don't see, I don't see his work as being distinctly Canadian. However, having said that, I think he was very much attached to the city of Montreal, particularly, it's, as we are all attached to our hometowns, um, regardless of how many years we are away from them. Um, and he wasn't only attached in a, in a kind of spiritual way, if you like, or psychological way, he was attached physically because he owned, uh, he owned a home there for many, many years from 1972 on and continued to use that home almost until the end of his life and kept returning. But here, he was a guy who was constantly on the go. He was, he was a week in Montreal and a week in New York and two weeks in Los Angeles and three, a month on Idra and, and a few weeks in London and then into Paris. And this was a circuit. He just kept moving around. Um, so I think the attachment is there, the psychological attachment to home, to homeland even, and certainly to Montreal. Um, but, I, but apart from the favorite game is his first novel, 1963, which is essentially about growing, coming of age in Montreal. And to some extent also um, Beautiful Losers, three years later. Um, and some of the early poetry obviously reflects aspects of Montreal, but beyond, but later later on, I think that connection, in a literary sense, disappears. Thank you. Our next question is: um, Given Cohen's apparent alienation from Judaism, what was the basis of his connection to Israel, land, community, liturgy? Well, first, I, I, I'm not sure I'd agree completely with the, the premise of the question. I don't think he's alienated from Judaism, not at all. Um, his attachment is, is deep and abiding. Um, even if he's not, you know, lighting Shabbos candles every Friday night or going to high holiday services every year, which I don't think he did. I, um, for sure, he didn't. He was, he was studying. He was studying Kabbalah. He, in the 1970s, he, he, he was studying with uh, the Hasidic movement. Um, in, in the 2000s, he, he had a rabbi in Los Angeles, two rabbis, in fact, one online and one in person that he would, he would attend 
um, Kabbalah classes with. So he was deeply interested. So I don't, I'm not sure I'd, I'd agree. What was the second part of that? Um, I mean, I think you, you captured that, but there's a follow-up question. Um, were there any specific Kabbalists or rabbis who had a major influence on Leonard? Yeah, um, I'm gonna forget the name of the one he did online. Uh, he's, he has passed, unfortunately, but he was an interesting character and Leonard had a lot of time for him and, and, and was financially quite generous to him. I think he actually kept him alive in his, in his late life. And they would have these regular sessions online. Um, uh, Mordecai Finley is the name of the rabbi um, who runs a congregation in, in Venice Beach, uh, Los Angeles. And, and he began attending, um, I think he attended a, somebody's wedding there in 2005 and was so impressed by Finley that he started to go regularly, uh, not only went to regular Sabbath services when he was in town, but began to attend Finley's Monday night uh, lectures on various aspects of, of Jewish philosophy and Jewish mysticism. Um, and he went in fact with, with his then girlfriend, uh, Anjani Thomas, they went together and he became a major donor to the congregation. And, and when Leonard was unwell when he was dying essentially in the last year of his life. Um, Rabbi Finley was of enormous help to him and came, came to his house and, and discussed um, life and death issues, the kind of issues that uh, confront us all at some point. So, so his attachment was, uh, he never severed that attachment. Even, even when he became, <laughs> even when he became a Buddhist, a Buddhist monk, his attachment to Judaism remained. He, um, there's a famous story about, you know, he would he 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 wouldn't have a regular Sabbath Friday night meal, although he sometimes did. But he would he occasionally would take his family and friends to a Korean place, which was called uh, Shabu Shabu in Los Angeles, and he would bring candles and challah on Friday night, and light the candles and cut the challah, and he, and the restaurant became known as Shabu Shabbos. That's great. Um, so there's another question that's related to uh, Leonard Cohen's relationship with Israel, and it's whether you can speak to the visit he made to Israel during the Yom Kippur War with Mati Kaspi. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I'm speculating here, but I think that Leonard kind of regretted that he didn't go in 1967 for the Six Day War. He was in, he could have in theory gone. He was in the middle of recording his first album in New York City. It, it, certainly the timing was all, all wrong for him. But I think part of him regretted that. When the 73 war broke out, he was on Idra. He was in a major um, meltdown in terms of his relationship with the mother of his children at the time. Uh, he later said, you know, he was asked, why did you go to the Sinai to sing for the troops? He said, I had to get out of the house. Um, but, and that isn't entirely true. I think, I think part of him really wanted to make some gesture, whether it was working on a kibbutz or, you know, digging trenches for the army, or as it turned out for singing at, at various camp bases around the Sinai and elsewhere. He wanted to make a, a contribution to that war effort. And it, and it left a real mark on him. He was exposed to things, you know, seeing young men die in front of you is not a pleasant thing. And, and it marked him. Okay, well, let's pivot a little bit. Um, we have a question asking, um, did Cohen think of writing as a form of prayer? I'm wondering perhaps if he might be channeling Kafka. Um, is that something you encountered, Michael? He write, in 1984, he published a book called The Book of Mercy, um, which was originally going to be called Book of Mercy, but he thought that was too grandiose a title. He didn't want to claim that this was the book of mercy. Um, so, uh, so he calls it the book of mercy and it, it is essentially 50 prayers. It's, it's unlike any other work that he produced. Um, they're, they're not poems, they're more like short prayers essentially. And they're, they're in many ways private. He was 50 years old, which is why there were 50 poems or 50 pieces in, in the book. Um, and he was struggling. He was struggling with the same questions I think that many of us struggle with, which is, you know, where is God in the post-Holocaust world? Um, and, 
and you know, and he was at the same time writing the lyrics to Hallelujah, which is when you begin to study it, um, very much a kind of, not the kind of um, anthemic wedding song that it's been turned into, but, but very much a kind of um, wrestling with God. Um, so these were, these were the issues that he was struggling with. So the Book of Mercy in 1984 is, is very much a religious work um, and, and quite unique, I think, in, in, his, in his canon. Um, another question we have is this, with 300 or more acid trips, did Leonard ever experience a psychedelic experience that went awry or required medical care? Um, I think he spoke generally positively about his experiences, um, I, 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 although he didn't speak in great detail. The only one that, that might um, address that question specifically is that when he was writing Beautiful Losers in 1965 on the island of Idra. He took a lot of um, LSD and speed, um, more speed, I think, than LSD. And, and he, he, would, he would go into, and he was fasting at the same time. So he'd be sitting on his terrace in the blazing sun, working on the novel under the influence of drugs and go for long stretches without eating and just only, only drinking water. And at the end of it, he had basically a nervous breakdown and had to be hospitalized. Um, so that, I don't, I don't know how much of that was, you know, what the ratio of LSD to speed was, but, but, but it was definitely a bad trip. And he, he, he just worked himself into a frenzy to finish that book. Um, and, and, and essentially, I'm told, nearly died at the time. Wow. Uh, so I'm going to amalgamate a couple of questions here. Um, um, Michael, can you talk a little bit about Leonard Cohen's early childhood when he attended yeshiva? And can you speak to whether or not you think he was a product of his upbringing versus a product of the times? Well, he's both, of course. Uh, he's a product, as we all are. Um, his, his early life, um, you know, he comes from a very privileged, affluent important Montreal family. His, his grandfather was one of the founders of, of, of the synagogue. He was on the executive, if he wasn't the president of every major uh, Canadian Jewish organization. He's one of the founders of the Canadian Jewish Congress, founded the Canadian Jewish News or whatever it was called at the time of its creation in, in the early 1900s. Uh, he was a major industrialist. The Cones, as somebody describes them in the book, were essentially Montreal Jewish royalty. So this is this is, and 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 as a child he is he is pampered and and loved and and dressed in the finest, you know Holt Renfrew clothing. Um, it, it's almost Edwardian, you know, kind of an Edwardian upbringing where um, where manners are insisted upon and decorum is insisted upon, and you don't speak unless spoken to. Um, I, I think you know, and and some part of this I think remains in his. In, in, in the later Leonard Cohen, you see all through his life, he has extraordinary good manners and, and graciousness and hospitality and generosity and a welcoming to strangers. Um, I think that those were lessons he, he learned early on and, and brought into himself um, and practiced, he practiced. He would have, he, he said on, on more than one occasion to to one of his best friends at the time, Barry Wexler, that what you had to do was to learn to look at life from high above the wheel. Um, and, 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 and I think he tried as much as possible to do that, to put himself in another man's shoes. There's another story, a wonderful story about an appearance he makes in 1974 at the Royal Albert Hall in London. He's giving a performance. And as he's walking to the stage with his guitar slung over his shoulder, he encounters a, a Spanish speaking caretaker who's sweeping the floor. And the show is about to begin. His name has been announced. Leonard is walking to the stage and he stops and he takes off his guitar from his shoulders and he strums for one minute or 30 seconds or whatever it was, uh, some flamenco chords that he thinks the caretaker, the Spanish speaking caretaker might appreciate. 
just a small gesture, a small event, a small moment in time, but, but something that was, came from his heart and came from a very generous place. You know, how could he, how could he enliven this moment for this man who was a complete stranger to him? And then he proceeded to make his way to the stage. So that I think gives you some insight into his personality. Yeah. Um, we have a question here. Uh, to what degree did he speak about or experience anti-Semitism? Um, there are some scenes in, in The Favorite Game, which I think is a hugely autobiographical novel, um, which suggests that as an adolescent, he and his friends did experience some, some anti-Semitism. It, it would be almost shocking, in fact, if he did not, because Montreal in the 1940s and 50s was, was a place that had a lot of anti-Semitic sentiment. Um, certainly um, both among Anglophones and, and French Canadians. So, um, but he didn't speak about it much. In fact, I, I'm hard pressed to think of a single instance where he addressed it. Oh, um, there, yeah, there is a moment when uh, in the sixties, because he, you know, in that, in that cultural stew that was Montreal in the, in the early 1960s to the mid 1960s, when French and, and Anglophone artists of all kinds, poets, writers, sculptors, what, filmmakers, mixed together and socialized and drank together and chased each other's women or men. Um, there was a lot of camaraderie and, and sociability and they regarded each other as, as friends. But when the independ uh, independence movement took hold in Montreal in the late 1960s and began to build um, Leonard noticed a distinct change and suddenly just the fact of his Jewishness made him to some, to some extent persona non grata uh, among some of those people, not all of them, but some of them. Um, and he did speak about that. You know, he's, he, he wondered, you know, what, what, ha what happened to our camaraderie? What, <laughs> why am I now the other? Um, um, so, there, so there was some, yes. Um, okay, I'm going to throw this out as a last question because we're coming to the end of our time. Um, this question is asking, um, is cur they're curious to hear how you think 2020 would have affected Cohen as an artist and mm. what themes would have emerged? That's a really good question. Um, you know, it would have been, it would have been uniquely Leonard. You know, it wouldn't have been the predictable, the expected, um, the formulaic. He would have found a way to write about it, but he would have found a way that would have been completely his own, his own stuff. Um, it, 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 it would have been surprising, not necessarily shocking, but it would have been surprising. He would have been able to, I'm pretty sure, find a way to stand back from 2020 and, and look at it from a distance or from above it. Um, and not embrace it in any of its many unfortunate details, um, but to cast it in a wider frame. I think that's what he was about, casting in a wider frame. Uh, I don't doubt he would have used it, but he would have used it uh, in his own unique way. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for managing the Q&A. There were a lot of really good answers in the uh, Q&A that those of us on the end have, have uh, you know, can see. So sorry we didn't get to, to everybody's, but um, they, they were actually really good questions. Um, Michael, thank you so much. This was thank a you. really fascinating, rich discussion, and you produced uh, a really wonderful book. I, I, I really enjoyed reading it, and I'm looking forward to reading the other two. Thank and you. I trust that many of our audience members, if they haven't read it, will hopefully pick up a copy too, and we'll gain some more insight. Thank you. Uh, about it. So thank you for writing it. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Entirely my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, I, lo I loved your questions and, and such a, it's a delight to see a, such a careful, intelligent, astute reading of the book. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I'll remind all of our, our uh, participant guests that, um, that as soon as we're done, this will, the, the video will appear um, on uh, the Center for Jewish Studies, the Israel and Golda Kashitsky Center for Jewish Studies YouTube channel. So 
you can watch it if you came in late or if you know of any other people who might be interested, you can uh, watch it more later. Um, uh, and that's it. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, thank you again, Michael. It was, it was a great you, honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you York. Thank, thank you, Kaczynski. Thank you, Carl, if you're not watching the Super Bowl. Bye, everybody. Be well. Bye.